Johnson said a few minutes ago. Well, folks, let's, yes, get, I, let's get started. I, I know there are a lot of people yeah, yeah. coming in. Yeah. Maybe. Oh. <laughs> Pretty funny. Yes. Um, I hope you've all had a good week. Um, it's sure. been a lot of fun. We, uh, Denny and I are in a, a Wednesday afternoon Bible discussion. In sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm Sharon. <laughs> yeah. I'm, sorry. Kind of, I'm kind of in the woodwork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, Sharon. And Sharon, too. I, I was looking around. Is anybody else? I keep here? moving. So you oh. <laughs> well, we're, um, we're uh, studying the book of Matthew and, uh, and a specific theory as to how that book was written and why. And so it's really interesting on my part, at least. Oh, and hello, Anne. Anne is here as, as well. It's really interesting on my part, at least, to, to do some comparisons between the book that we're reading and uh, the, you know, on Wednesday and the book that we're reading here. Um, it does get confusing, though, so if I uh, get my biblical passages mixed up, that's, that's why. Sometimes uh, uh, Amy Jill Levine will refer to Mark. She seems to be using the three synoptic gospels rather literally, not really focusing on one. Um, and just so you know, the Synoptic Gospels are the ones that are the, the three that can be read together, Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, when they were written, it appears, good morning, Phyllis. Good morning. When they were, when they were written, it appears that uh, Mark was written first, and then Matthew used Mark to write his gospel and added to Mark's gospel. And then Luke also used Mark. And so when we read those three stories, when we read those three narratives, we can see very clearly if now I've said this before, but if if I were grading Matthew or Luke in a, uh, you know, in a college classroom, I would hand their pack papers back and say, hey, this has been plagiarized, you know, uh, <laughs> because it's very, in fact, I once had a friend, his name is David Duncan, now, now deceased, no longer with us, but uh, he did with this with some students, and they learned very quickly the last place you want to try to plagiarize a paper is in a, the classroom of a biblical scholar, because that's what they do. They read texts, and they say, oh, this was probably written first, and then this person took this text and, and added to it, and that's just precisely what happened with three students uh, in one of David's classrooms, and they were kind of mystified as to how he could figure all that out. Well, that's what Biblical scholars, especially uh, those who get into textual criticism, that's what they do. Uh, so it does appear that Mark was written first, and Matthew and Luke. And then John, as we're going to find out, possibly today or next week, is a story unto itself, really. The whole, um, the whole historical narrative, the chronology of John, is different. For example, we saw the, the so-called cleansing of the temple uh, that occurs in the last week of Jesus' life uh, at, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics. But in John, anybody remember where that appears? Chapter 2. So, so John begins his whole narrative of Jesus right after the, the my favorite miracle, turning water into wine, you know. Uh, and then... And then uh, he has the story of Jesus cleansing the temple. Very same story, but just at a different point in, in Jesus' life. We're going to find also that John is going to be, uh, is going to have a different chronology uh, when it comes to the, the crucifixion and the resurrection as well. And the question we want to ask is, well, the one thing that we don't want to do, or at least you know, in this, this class, when we're using the historical critical method, is to just assume that, well, you know, this is not a, an important issue. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, John is going to say that Jesus was crucified on one day. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are going to say that Jesus was crucified on a cl completely different day, right? Instead of throwing up our arms and saying, oh, well, this isn't true, right? This isn't factual or anything like that. We have, because writers in the First century, we're not writing history. They did not know what history was, getting all the dates and the facts right. In many ways, they were writing a kind of, I don't want to use this term, they were writing a mythology, by which I mean stories that had symbolic meaning, allegories that, uh, to, that gave insight into kind of heavenly truths. 
Um, so we have to ask, why did John you know, write his gospel the way he did, with the passion on one day, and then Matthew, Mark, and Luke with the passion on another day? It's fascinating stuff. But you know, when, when people are, are first coming to seminary, one of the first things that they do is they learn this historical critical method, and they have a real uh, you know, uh, crisis of faith. Because many who come to seminary uh, are, you know, come out of, of a tradition where the Bible needs to be read literally, right? And um, and so <clears throat> many of them don't, you know, will, will say, I, I just can't do this. You know, this is just not right for me, and they'll drop out. And, but others struggle through it, and, and they come up with a different understanding, a, a newer insights into uh, how this text can be divinely inspired. And that's one thing I want to make sure that we know, that when we're looking at some of this historical critical data, we're not saying that the text is not divinely inspired. Uh, but we're also not saying that the text just fell out of heaven, you know, written in stone without any changes in it whatsoever. As in all things, there is a, a, a synthesis of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, working through the historical individual context of an author like Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And that person's insights go into uh, the text as, as written. So, well, Mandy, so any, any questions or comments about that? I hope today also that you'll feel free to just jump in and ask uh, some questions. Um, because I, you know, obviously I find this fascinating because it dedicated my whole life to it, which is, I look back now, I'm thinking, well, how in the world did I get this old? <laughs> That's not that interesting. It just seems like last, last week that Matt over there was a, a student in David McCarthy's Bible class, right? That's true. It, that, is, that is actually what happened <laughs> last week. It was 21 years ago. 21 years ago. So. Anyway, well, let's. Um, I want to remind you of the context, the historical context, and the geographical context. Uh, in the first century, remember this. If I had a bigger map, this would be the Mediterranean. This would be present-day Turkey. Over here, you've got Greece, and then you've got Italy. But this is the area that we're focusing on primarily. This would primarily. This would have been the area of Jesus' life. Phyllis asked, "What is the distance between Galilee and Jerusalem?" and uh, it's not that much. It's about, actually, it's exactly 63.4 miles, just so you know. It's about 50 miles. Uh, people would come to Jerusalem for these uh, holy feast days, as we said. But notice that this area is divided up into regions that have a, a different, uh, the name of the person would be a tetrarch, a ruler. And in Jesus' day, the sons of King Herod the Great, if you remember King Herod who tried to uh, you know, murder Jesus upon his death, he died in um, 4 BCE. However, his sons, one of them being called Herod Antipas, uh, were put into uh, four different regions. The son that took over Judea and Idumea, now the regions here are Galilee, Samaria, Judea and Idumea, and then this area known as the Decapolis on the other side, or the Transjordan. The son that was placed in Judea, in Jerusalem, you can imagine this. This would have been about the time that Jesus was, you know, 29, 30 years old. Uh, actually, a little before that. Uh, he was so uh, corrupt and so violent that the Romans themselves pulled, took him out, you know. Now, if you've got to be pretty darn violent if the Romans are going to say, now this guy's just a little too crazy for us because <laughs> the Romans had, had no qualms about, you know, taking people without a trial and just uh, and crucifying them for broken Roman uh, control. Um, Judea down here is going to be very, very conservative in terms of its uh, understanding of Judaism. Uh, this is where Jerusalem is going to be located. And later on, uh, I'll show you another map. Uh, it's going to be a, a detail of this area right here, which is um, uh, around the Temple Mount and also Bethany and Bethpage. And this, this is going to, to <coughs> feature prominently in the last three days of Jesus' life. Uh, some of you have been uh, to Israel recently. Any thoughts or insights uh, about how this map is playing on your memory? 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. To repeat, the distance is very short. Very, very it's short. People, it's hard to imagine. Yeah. Uh, so the distance would be between or grand, or like like between here and St. Paul. Roughly. You know, that's Galilee of St. Paul and Judea would uh, Jerusalem would be Hastings. So the distance is very short. This area is very desert oriented as you move down closer to Egypt, but as you get up to the just the tip of Galilee, you get into something called the, the Fertile Crescent. And so the area that Jesus would have come from would have been agricultural. And we can see that because of all of the agricultural allusions he makes, you know, the, the wheat and the tares and, uh, you know, the various uh, parables that he often tells. He's telling them to people in his region who would, you know, certainly understand uh, the, the implications of the story he's telling him. But also this region, if you look up here, this, this area known by the Romans as Phoenicia, but in present, present day Lebanon, this is where all the cedars of Lebanon came from before they were completely decimated. Um, it's also a Gentile area. So Jesus, when he was growing up, probably had interaction with Gentiles. And by Gentiles, I mean anyone who's not Jewish. So um, there's a saying in the New Testament, can anything good come out of Nazareth, right? Uh, we don't know exactly what that means, but one of the things it may mean is that you know Nazareth is right in the middle of you know the Gentile territory. A lot of the uh, economics that were involved in Galilee uh, were dependent upon Roman building projects, for example. So Jesus, uh, there's a, a a city named Sepphoris nearby that would have been built at the time that Jesus was living, and if Jesus were a carpenter, which basically means a day laborer. Uh, these guys that, you know, will get on the, on the corner, put up a sign saying, we'll work, you know, I've got, you know, give me eight hours of work. In every city in the United States, it seems there's a place where you can go and find uh, laborers who are working for the day. Jesus would have been among them. Uh, let's not think in terms of, you know, a carpenter with a square and all that. Uh, it's, it's easy to do because that's what we understand a carpenter to be. But Jesus was a, a day laborer. And uh, probably would have had a lot of interaction with this uh, with this territory uh, in in the north. But eventually, uh, he uh, is inspired, uh, baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptist was doing some really um, provocative type of preaching at this time, wanting the people of Israel to return to an understanding of themselves as living not, living not as so much Roman in Roman territory, but living as if the Jewish state under uh, King David and under you know, the law of Moses was in its perfect form. So what John the Baptist would do is he would take people across the Jordan and he would baptize them. It was very, very clear what he was trying to do if you know the story of Joshua, how the people of Israel came into the land of, um, at that time it was called Canaan, came into the land, but the way they did so, they had to cross the Jordan River. And the story goes is that the Jordan River parted uh, so that they could you know, come through and enter the land. So on either side of that story in, you know, in, in Exodus, uh, the, the Red Sea parts, for the people to go into their wandering, and then the Jordan River parts, so the people can, you know, go into you know, 40 years later, according to the story, so the people can go into the land flowing with milk and honey. Well, John the Baptist was taking people on the other side of the Jordan to reenact that uh, event in the life of the history of, of Israel, uh, so that Jesus would have been part of that uh, reenactment. John the Baptist was saying, live as if you are under the covenant in the same way that the people in Joshua's time are under the covenant and trying to establish uh, yourself in this landscape, uh, living under the covenant of God, by which we mean the Ten Commandments and all of the other commandments, uh, the mit so-called mitzvot that follow uh, over those. It was not a political, um, it was not so much a political uh, movement. John wasn't calling for the overthrow of the Romans, but in, in 
in the fashion very similar to what we see in our society today, you know, we are beholden to the laws of the United States and to the Constitution as well. But we also have a, a you know, a moral responsibility to our Christian faith. Sometimes those come in conflict, right? Uh, in the United States, often we tend to conflate legality and morality. You know, if it's legal, well then, I oh, am yeah, no problem. I can do it. But there are times when those things which are legal are not necessarily moral, and we have to decide, okay, uh, what what direction do I follow here? Do I, you know, uh, emphasize my Christian faith and the morality that that entails, or do I, you know, just say, well, you know. It's okay to, to do whatever particular act we're talking about. I don't want to mention anything because I could probably offend somebody one way or the other. You know, <laughs> but you know, if, if the uh, if the country allows me to do that and everyone else is doing it, well, then, you know, why not me? Um, that is the movement that Jesus is a part of. He's part of the John the Baptist movement, and he's preaching this in continuation of John the Baptist's uh, sermons. John the Baptist is eventually going to be perceived as Herod, uh, by Herod Antipas as a threat, and Herod's wife, uh, Salome, is going to, through all kinds of trickery, ask for John the Baptist's head, and pretty, pretty soon Jesus is the person, and may even have seen himself as the person continuing John the Baptist's ministry. Historically, we do know uh, that John the Baptist existed. You know, uh, a historian by the name of Josephus mentions him in his writings. So the Romans know about him. Josephus doesn't mention Jesus. We don't know anything about Jesus. Historically, we can't put Jesus in a particular place at a particular time. So we just have our faith documents to go on. Um, so let me move on with this. Uh, any, any questions or comments uh, about that? John the Baptist. I want to talk today about a story. Uh, re remember what we're doing. We're in the last week of Jesus' life. We started with the triumphal entry, Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the colt of an ass, and then uh, moved to uh, the so-called cleansing of the temple. And Jesus up upsets the tables of the money changers. Then we looked at some of Jesus' teachings. Uh, we looked at, uh, especially at the story of the um, you know, Good Samaritan, for example. Um, you know, and all of a sudden, I can't remember what were some of the other things that we were talking about. Oh, of course, the teaching on taxes, right? And how uh, how Jesus was. to God. So if all things are given to God, nothing's left over to give to Caesar. Now we come to a, a situation where uh, it's getting to be Thursday, let's call it, of the Holy Week. And what typically happened, this is the only map that I could find that uh, really gave me the locality I wanted to talk about. But what typically happened when uh, you came to Jerusalem for a, a feast day is that you would spend sometimes a week. Uh, so I, again, liken it to the Husker game, right? You go up into uh, to Lincoln. Sometimes you'll spend the night at a friend's house or something. That's what Jesus did. Uh, when he came to uh, the Passover in Jerusalem for Holy Week, he spent his time, or he had um, acquaintances, at least. We don't know exactly where he initiated the whole um, um, uh, triumphal entry. But our source tells us, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, that it probably began here at Beth Page. Uh, but there's also an incident that takes place in Bethany. Now, were you, those of you who are visiting, were you able to go to Bethany and the Mount of Olives and all of that? Do you remember the Mount of Olives? Um, um, <clears throat> right, this is a, a valley. <clears throat> here is the Temple Mount. Here's where the temple would be. And of course, associated with this, you have Herod's palace and then his son Antipas's palace. You also have the house of Caiaphas, who was the high priest. 
So this was like uh, the political district of, of Jerusalem here. Today, that is the Jewish quarter. So this little area right here would be the Western Wall, if you can see the map. Okay, I'm sorry if you can't. Um, and, you know, not everybody had, you know, associations in Jerusalem. So they would usually go and spend, you know, uh, evenings elsewhere, you know, maybe two or three miles away outside of the city. Kidron Valley runs through here. There's a, today there's an interstate that runs along this, you know, and lots of noise and everything. But then you climb a considerable, I couldn't give you the number of feet, but you can climb a considerable uh, elevation to the so-called Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, there's a, a kind of a, a garden there called Gethsemane. Uh, at the other end of the Mount of Olives in this area that we're talking about is a small area known as Bethany. And Jesus is going to visit uh, friends in Bethany. Uh, if we read the Gospel of John, we know that those friends are Mary and Martha, who are the uh, sisters of Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. But the story doesn't begin in John, chronologically. The story begins in Mark. And there's something that's curious about how the story is written over periods of time. But let's read the story as, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Amy Jill Levine uh, puts it in. I should have probably made a... I should have uh, put in my bookmark. Sorry about this. Now, Amy Jill Levine is going to um, give us the story in Matthew. She's also going to give us the story in John, but I do want to take a little diversion and talk about Luke as well. Uh, so this is Mark chapter, sorry, Mark chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. Mark has 16 chapters, so this is right towards the end. There's two full chapters uh, that are going to deal with the crucifixion. Interestingly enough, there's no resurrection story in Mark. The oldest gospel that we have does not feature a story of the resurrection. It, basically, the women come to the tomb and find it empty, and someone there says, hey, the body was stolen. The end. <laughs> uh, you might imagine that later authors uh, found that to be unacceptable, right? Oh, wait a minute. Matthew's got the resurrection. Luke does. John does. So what they did is they added on a resurrection story, Mark. And even if you read it in English, you can tell someone another author has written it because it's using very, very, you know, $20, a lot of $20 words that you did not see Mark using at all. Now, I, I tell you this only to, you know, not to undermine your faith or anything, only to say that um, these gospels are developing over time. And uh, stories that are told are told to particular audiences to, and they have a particular uh, frame of reference that they want to try to get across. So let's think about this story. And I want to set up what we're going to talk about because there's a famous story in which Jesus uh, is confronted by a woman or a woman comes in while he's eating and she anoints him in one way with, or another. And that anointing is going to be different in different uh, Gospels. But here's the oldest uh, story. And this is what uh, Amy Jo Levine refers to as the first dinner. She sets up this dichotomy between the first dinner and the last supper. So this would have been shortly before Jesus' death when he is reclining at table with, uh, well, it's a different group of people in every Gospel, you know. In one gospel, it's Simon the leper. In another gospel, it's Simon the Pharisee. In another gospel, it's uh, Mary, Martha, and, and Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus. Um, and it, it's important to note when we're talking about reclining at the table, we're not talking about sitting at chairs with a table up here. Uh, this would have, people would have been eating in the Roman style. They would have uh, been lying on their left side, you know, with their, supporting their hand and, you know, kind of eating food this way. And so, um, it's in this context that this story is uh, told. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. 
And she broke open the, nar uh, the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for, for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you. And you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. By the way, that is a quote from De Deuteronomy. So Jesus is not just making that up. He's quoting you know, one of the sacred texts of, um, of the Jewish tradition. You always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to read all four of the stories, but I, there are a couple things I want to say, first of all, and then I'll read some of the others so you can see some of the differences. Um, and the main difference is going to be where Jesus is anointed. It's only in the Gospel of Mark that this woman comes and anoints Jesus' head with oil. Uh, in the other three Gospels, as this stained glass window shows, she's anointing Jesus' feet. Um, and, you know, people say, well, you know, two different stories. You know, when were, Jesus was getting anointed by one woman on, you know, on the head, and then by this other woman, you know, on, on his feet. And what's the problem there? But remember the whole plagiarism issue, right? You can tell that the structure of the story has maintain, been maintained. It's like I can tell when three students hand in a paper <laughs> and, you know, they change some of the names, but the structure of the story has, has remained the same. And so most likely, according to the uh, to biblical scholars, this was a single event. But then using historical critical method, we have to ask why the changes? I mean, there are, you know, cosmetic changes in one uh, situation, it's Simon the leper's house, another Simon the Pharisee, another, you know, but this change between um, anointing the head and anointing the feet is significant. So a lot of consternation has gone into this, and I have to tell you, uh, I don't know why. I don't know why the difference. I mean, there are a lot of uh, theories about this, but I've, you know, it's not like the first time I've thought about it. Uh, but for years now, I can't figure out why this change. And so I would put it to you uh, to ask uh, that question and maybe come up with your own answer. But let me tell you a little bit more about what was happening in, in anointing. In the Hebrew Bible, uh, anointing was done in various ways. We still see, for example, uh, in the Roman Catholic tradition, you, uh, when you receive last rites, you and your head is anointed with oil. Uh, there was anointing that would be done for um, uh, renewal purposes, health purposes, you know, symbolically, anoint your head with oil, you know, so that good health may return to you. Uh, there is also an anointing uh, that involves sensuality. If you read the Song of Songs, or if you even read the, uh, the Book of Ruth, uh, where Ruth quite literally, as we've learned recently, Denny, in our, our, uh, in our uh, study in Sharon, uh, she anoints her body with perfume to be attractive. So that, that's how the word anointing is used as well. And there's also the idea of anointing, symbolically cleansing a body uh, with, um, with oil and herbs and spices, or not herbs and spices, it's uh, you know, unguents, uh, very uh, uh, beautiful smelling types of uh, uh, substances. Uh, but the anointing we often think about when we, um, when we talk about the New Testament is that tradition that goes back in the Hebrew Bible to what would happen when a king uh, was, you know, received his coronation. If you read uh, Psalm 2, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, it, it, it uses a lot of imagery that we know about in the New Testament. Uh, 
a priest would get up and it would, he would sing this psalm. Today I have anointed you with oil. Today I have begotten you and you are my son. This is God speaking through the priest to the king. The priest anoints his head with oil and sings this psalm, um, you know, and uh, the, the person is recognized throughout the land as, as, as the king. The word in uh, Greek is Christos. To anoint in Greek is to christen. Is how, that's where we get our word from. And so when we talk about Jesus Christ, uh, we're not, as, <laughs> as one of my students once said, that you know, it, it was his last name you know, from Jesus, Joseph and Mary <laughs> Christ from, from Nazareth. No, this is an honorific title. Uh, Jesus is the anointed one. Uh, which is an ironic thing to say in the midst of the Roman Empire, where to be a king was to be a threat and would be immediately taken out uh, by the Romans, right? And we know on his uh, uh, on, on the cross at the crucifixion, uh, the titulus that was placed at the top that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And of course, it was a mockery uh, to say that, uh, but basically giving people an understanding why this guy was being crucified. Uh, there's only one king of the Jews, and that is the one that the Romans appoint. Right? Uh, the word in Hebrew for anointing is Mashiach. Um, this is where we get our word Messiah from. So when we say Jesus Christ, we, we mean Jesus the Messiah, Jesus who is recognized as the long-awaited Messiah, who, uh, who is going to... Uh, save not just the Jews, but all nations uh, uh, as a son of David. And this was a tradition that was in the Hebrew Bible for a very long time. Uh, if we read in Isaiah uh, chapter 2, it talks about Jerusalem as being the city on a hill that gives light to all the world, to which all the nations would come, all of the nations, when the Messiah reigned. Uh, the temple that I showed you, that picture before, you remember it's got the court of the Gentiles outside of the temple? That was in direct, uh, uh, I guess, relationship with the idea of all of the nations will come to Jerusalem and uh, will know that God, the God of Israel, is the God of all. Uh, so people are recognizing Jesus as some sort of Messiah. They're not really quite sure Many uh, think he's going to be this, you know, uh, military leader like David was. But it's interesting that the nameless people, and this is a point that Amy Jill Levine wants to make, the nameless people here, we don't know this woman's name, at least in this story. Uh, she takes the risk of, of proclaiming her faith, professing her faith, so to speak, by going into the house of someone she doesn't know. Um, taking an alabaster, you know, this white flask full of nard, and I'll tell you what nard is here uh, soon, and pouring it over Jesus' head. Of course, everybody gets upset. Nard, 300 denarii, that's about, that's about how much somebody would make in, a, in a, a year, an annual salary. But she sacrifices it for her profession of who she believes Jesus to be. Now, it's easy to say, oh, well, she's taking on the role of the priest here and, and, and anointing Jesus' head with oil. And that may have uh, some bearing on why uh, the later stories have her anoint Jesus' feet, right? So let's, let's hold that at bay for a minute. But remember, when you're also reading these texts, you have to read the text in the original language. Uh, the word for anointing to, you know, Christane in, in Greek, you would expect if, if Jesus was going to be anointed as a king, you would expect that word to be used, Christane, but it's not. That's not the word that's used. This word, marizo, is anointing for burial. You can see the word myrrh in there. Myrrh was one of the spices that was used uh, uh, to anoint a body uh, before burial. It was certainly among the spices that um, um, that Mary and Joanna and Susanna and the others, the other women, took uh, to anoint Jesus' body while it was in the tomb. But prior to this, 
this woman has this appears to have this premonition, right? That something is going to happen to Jesus. And you know, it probably didn't take much because Jesus is causing all kinds of problems right there in Roman territory. And she takes it upon herself to go and make this profession, this proclamation, in a way that um, uh, is symbolic that not everyone quite understands. Because let's, let's face it, the disciples themselves were pretty thick-headed. Even, even right up to the crucifixion, they just didn't get it, right? They're, they're, uh, they've got great plans of splendor in mind. They, they argue with each other who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you know? And, Jesus is, <laughs> must have just been like, oh gosh, why couldn't you, why couldn't you give me twelve women? <laughs> because apparently it's the women who understand, you know, what's going on. Now, unfortunately, the women have been given a bad rap in the Bible. Um, let me tell you how the story has been used. This story in Mark is in Matthew is roughly the same, except for the anointing of the feet in Matthew and the head in Mark. In Luke, however, um, just give me a chance. Let me read it for you in Luke, just so you can understand what we're what we're talking about here. In Luke, it's a story that has a slight variation on it, but what happens after the story um, is what's important here. Luke seven thirty six through fifty. All right, this this woman is a sinful woman. We didn't hear that in the Mark story. This is a woman who's a sinner. Right? One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he, Jesus, went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was uh, eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. And this would be the, the image we have here. Dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them uh, with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. He would have known she's a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors, and then he goes to tell the story of one person who has his debt forgiven, uh, and it's a small debt, twenty dollars, right? But another person has a debt of five thousand dollars, right? And it's forgiven by the creditor. Jesus tells that story and asks the Pharisee, "Which which of these two uh, debtors do you think would have been more grateful for forgiveness?" Well, obviously the, the one that uh, had the greatest debt, and uh, so that's how he explains this woman, a sinner. And sinner, uh, hamartia, basically means any, we're all sinners, right? It doesn't say what her sin was, but we assume it, it, she was a prostitute. Now, here's the funny part. Here's where it gets really kind of interesting. Okay, next chapter, Luke is going to start out and say, oh, you know, there were some women that were running around with Jesus here. I, I don't want to say running around, that's not right. Who were following <laughs> Jesus, right? Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Soon afterwards, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, uh, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod Stuart, Kutza, and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their resources. Oh, now a connection is made historically, and, and we can look, we can see very specifically who did, did it. Pope Gregory in the sixth century said that the woman Mary Magdalene, who had been uh, healed of seven demons, was the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with oil. Text does not say that. Uh, the sinner in this story is believed to have been a, a woman who sinned through the sin of prostitution. The text does not say that. However, for the last 1,500 years, if you ask anybody on the street, tell me who Mary Magdalene was. Oh, she was a prostitute. 
she was a prostitute who was with Jesus. And, you know, uh, what the text says, listen to this. This is funny, isn't it? Um, and Susanna um, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. Most likely, Mary of Magdala. Magdala was an area that uh, was on the Sea of Galilee that was um, rather prosperous. Most likely, Mary Magdalene was bankrolling Jesus' whole ministry or providing for Jesus in some way. This is what recent scholarship is telling us. Um, and this, Angel Levine wants to make this point because we often get the sense that women were completely oppressed, had no voice, had you know, no um, uh, freedoms whatsoever. That's not what our text shows here. Uh, these are women who... Uh, own their own homes. We know that uh, the mother of, of James and John uh, owned a home in Jerusalem. It says very clearly in the text it was her house. We know Mary and Martha of Bethany have their home as well. It's identified with them. Uh, they are obviously, they have the ability to move freely around the country. All of those things. I think what we tend to do is think that, you know, we have a kind of a Taliban situation in the first century with Jewish women, like they were completely oppressed and had no freedoms whatsoever. But the interesting thing about all of this is, is most likely the women who understood Jesus best of all. Well, the, you know, and I know I'm getting into gender politics here, but really, when you read the text, the, the disciples are completely out of the loop. They think Jesus is going to be a Messiah like King David. Uh, the Romans are going to be destroyed by whatever means, whether military means or by, uh, you know, this, this, the hope that God, and this was prominent at the time, the hope that God would come in and establish a new kingdom altogether. And they were thinking about, you know, uh, what am I going to be, Secretary of the Interior? And I, I should probably be Secretary of State. That, those are the kind of ideas that they had in their mind. The women following Jesus had this intuition, and we see it in the story, right? This anointing is not the anointing of a king on a throne with a palace, but is an anointing of a king whose crown is a crown of thorns, whose throne is a, a, a cross, and whose kingdom is utterly spiritual. And toward that, an alabaster jar of nard, which is very clearly one of the most expensive uh, substances, ointments that you can use for burial, uh, was was the probably the the best and most symbolic uh, and the most profound gift that could be offered, not just to Jesus, but in this case to a Pharisee, to the people at the table, the people who were thinking. In, in very two-dimensional terms, well, that could have been sold for, for the, you know, the poor and things like that. And Jesus must have just been shaking his head like, I still don't get it. It's like a day away from my crucifixion and you're, and you're uh, you, know, you know, you're halfway there, but you're not all the way there. So let me see if there are any questions and I'll a ask Anne too, because she's often. But yeah, go ahead. When, when did the changes take place from the anointing? at the head and the anointing of the feet, and who made them and why did they make them? All right, so um, it was clearly in Mark in the 70 of the common era. When it gets transferred to Matthew and Luke, it's probably in 85 of the common era, 15 years later. Now, Mark wrote for a community of people that what, had some Gentile converts. They, they converted from their Gentile pagan religions to uh, Christianity. When Matthew wrote his gospel, he had, had Mark in his hands, and he looked at the story and said, yeah, that's a good story, but um, I don't know. I, I, I think what we need to get from the story is different. One thing I'm going to do is take out the anointing of the head, and Luke does the same thing. John does the same thing. Now, Matthew would have done it 15 years later. John would have done it 30 years later. Why did they do it? And that's the question uh, we, we don't really know. My guess, the one, the, one of the best guesses is, is that, um, first of all, a woman was usurping the role of a high priest 
in anointing the head of Jesus. If people were going to see that Jesus was truly a Messiah, they were not going to accept a woman anointing his head with oil. In this day, I mean, despite what Amy Jo Levine says about freedoms that women have, men and women were usually segregated quite, quite clearly. Even in the temple, we saw there was a court of women and a court of men. And this outrageous uh, event happens that is included in Mark's gospel, um, that a woman plays the role symbolically of a high priest. That just probably would not sit well. However, women who are, and my friend Todd who's a, an atheist and, and, and he and I go back and forth on this. I don't try to convince him one thing, he doesn't try, but he says, oh, that's, that's very clear. They, they wanted women to be subservient, right? And so the next gospel writers put the woman in her place. Oh, she's, she's very, very, uh, she's, she's very, very devout, right? Um, but she anoints Jesus' feet. You know, we're not going to put her in the role of the high priest. That's, that's about as good an explanation as I can find as any. Uh, any, anybody want to jump in on this? I don't want to. Uh, mine is just conjecture. Right? Yeah, Danny. And the segregation still continues at the uh, Western Wall. Yes, right. Wow. That kind of segregation, you know, women had their place. And there was a lot of fear over uh, women's bodies, biological uh, functions, right? Menstruation, things like that were seen as unclean. You had it, you know, a certain period of time when you couldn't come in contact after your menstrual period, you could not come in contact. Uh, you could not go to synagogue, for example. Uh, so there is a lot of um, uh, taboo around women's bodies. Uh, so an anointing happening in this probably was just a little too much for Matthew, Mark, uh, for Matthew, Luke, and John. But listen to the story as it's uh, told in John. Now we have actual names that are associated with the story. Oh, wrong way, sorry. And now we know that it, the story takes place here in Bethany. And here's what the story says. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with them. Mary took a pound of costly perfume, Mary now, made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was the perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? And then a little aside here. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept a <laughs> common purse and used to steal uh, what was put into it. And Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. You see how the, the common elements of the story have remained. But John was obviously wanting to say something about Judas. And actually in our next class, uh, this idea of betrayal is a, an idea that also develops over time. When we see in uh, Paul, Paul's words li literally mean handed over or handed up, not so much a betrayal. And, and I'll talk about that next time. Um, but here it's Mary who has the nard, and it's not Mary Magdalene. There, Mary, by the way, as you might imagine, um, is one of the most popular names in, in Ju Judea and, and Samaria and, and wherever. Uh, it's... Uh, an Aramaic form of Miriam, who was the uh, sister of, of Moses. Um, is that right? Is Miriam the sister of the wife of Moses? I can't remember that. I'm having a yeah, senior moment here of this. But Miriam has a, a, a very famous song in, uh, after the, the, um, uh, the parting of the Red Sea, when she praises God as a liberator. And it was this Passover feast of liberation that Jesus came to Jerusalem to, to observe. Um, but we're moving, and I'll, I'll just 
kind of set the scene, we're moving towards um, the Last Supper. Now, we're, we looked at today, it was called the First uh, first Dinner, right? Uh, we're moving towards the Last Supper, which is going to be the Passover meal. And I'll tell you a little bit next time about how Passover was celebrated. But the idea that Jesus is going to die has already been introduced. And this is really good uh, literary narrative. You're dropping breadcrumbs toward the climax of the story. Um, but it's prior to this event that we all know is, is, hap is going to happen. Uh, dramatic irony that disciples are just still scratching their head over it. Like, hey, what's this, what's this you're talking about? One of us is going to betray you and everything. Um, we're dropping breadcrumbs, moving to the event. And that Last Supper is going to be the place where the symbolism of Jesus as not a Messiah who wears a crown of gold and is anointed by a high priest with oil, but a Messiah who wears a crown of thorns and is anointed by a nameless woman uh, and sits on a throne called the cross. Um, that is the direction we are, we are moving in here. So in our time left, do, we, do you have any comments or questions about this? The next time we get together, we're going to talk about the difference between the first dinner and the last supper. Uh, you know, I, I hesitated in putting this uh, image up here, but, but just to kind of whet your appetite on where we're going, this is the only image that I could find that has this lamb on the table. Jews celebrating the Passover would have had you know, a portion of an animal, usually a, a, a lamb or a goat, that had been sacrificed in the temple. Sacrifices would take place. You would bring your offering to the temple. A portion of it would be burnt as an offering, or a sin offering, or a, uh, a Thanksgiving offering to God. And then another, the other portion would be given back to the person making the sacrifice, and they would take it and have a Passover meal. Uh, but if you look at this painting and you read the story of the Passover meal, you will see that there's there's a disconnect here. And I want to talk about that disconnect next time. And we'll also talk about um, the varying accounts of how of Jesus' last supper, first starting in 1 Corinthians, written around 55, and then in Mark, written around 70, and then Matthew and Luke in 85, and then in John in 100 of the Common Era. But will help us to see the development of the theology. And John is the one who's key here. John is the key. He's going to be the one who's going to change things so that people can clearly see the spiritual transition that's taking place between the Jews and uh, you know this that now open synagogue we might call uh, the church. So any comments about that before we move on? Go ahead. I'm Chuck. surprised to see the Corinthians. Paul wrote his yeah. letter to the Corinthians. Yeah. And that was written before the Gospels. Yes. I yeah. know that. Yes, absolutely. And so if we were to study a chronological uh, reading of the New Testament, we would begin with 1 Thessalonians. That was the first letter that Paul wrote. Um, and then we would move on to probably 1 Corinthians. Um, but Paul wrote in a period between 51 and 62 or so. Uh, and he gives us absolutely no insight into Jesus' life. If you read Paul's letters, he doesn't really talk a lot about Jesus, you know, he, other than to say he died for our sins, but then he's, you know, he's giving instructions to various churches and things like that. But this idea that there's a narrative to Jesus' life, not so much in Paul at all. It's 70 of the common era when the gospels actually get written down uh, 40 years after Jesus has, has died. And this is what our historical critical study wants to emphasize is that the gospels tell roughly the same story, but they emphasize symbolically different aspects of you know, what we just discussed today, anointing the head or anointing the feet. Um, now you see why I do what I do, right, Chuck? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is just amazing stuff. It's, it's just absolutely fascinating. So, well, is there anything, any announcement you'd like to make, Sharon, before we 
not necessarily. I think next week and then it'll be on Sunday after that. Is that right? I thought we just, just have one more one or two more? more. I can't remember. Saying, well, Mike, we want to let you know it. next week we will be yeah. reading. Uh, is it, next week's not Palm Sunday, is no, it? No, can't remember. It's the week after that. Oh, uh, gee, I should know, right? Uh -huh. um, Actually, it might be. Well, I think, Sunday. Sunday. I think it is Palm Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. Think. I was just thinking, this is April, isn't it? Mm. it, is it April. Is well, next week we, we will be looking at chapter yeah. five. So, ironically, we will we will be studying the last night on the Sunday that commemorates the beginning. the beginning of this whole study that we've been doing. So, any other questions? Yeah, Tim. Hey, um, I think one of the, the extraordinary things that Amy Jo Levine has done for us is to show the connection between the gospel writers and the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. That it is without question. Right. You know that they are drawing, and Jesus was drawing on yeah. the Hebrew Bible. Right. Jesus was not starting a new re religion. He was trying. He was a reformer, basically yeah. trying to reform Judaism to get it back to a, a, a purer state, because it has it been sullied over the last five hundred years by Greeks and Romans and you know uh, all kinds of other, uh, I guess, interactions, cultural interactions. So, uh, any, yeah, we'll, we can talk about this next time, but this universalizing tendency is really the, the unique thing that, that Jesus brings. It's not just those who are circumcised, and it, but it is the entire um, human race that is uh, uh, in relationship with God. So, Which makes the anti-Semitism of the last 2,000 years very, tragic very, and ironic. Very, very tragic and very interesting. Very much. And that, this is one of the things that's happening in scholarship now, trying to make that connection. So a smart Jewish scholar yeah. can yeah. give us a lot of insight. <laughs> exactly. Well, our, our time's upon us. I want to give you some time to get to, um, get to uh, worship. And next Sunday, I guess, will be our last Sunday. So if you haven't read chapter 5 and you want to, that's what we'll be talking about. So let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious God, always thankful for the time, the opportunity to meet as curious believers, delving into your word, asking questions, and being inspired all the same. We ask that you be with us this week and help us to be good models of your faithfulness. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.